had the chance to sit down with Rob Moffat. Now, he's a partner of Balderton Capital, which owns the title of the largest Series A focused European VC. Now, the VC firm has a bevy of fintech portfolio companies, including Global Money App Revolut, which announced a $66 million funding round just this week to help it expand geographically, but to also push into cryptocurrencies. Now, before delving into the world of blockchain, though, I started by asking, well, where he was finding opportunities to invest and the types of businesses catching his eye. Take a listen. We've historically seen, we've seen a lot of activity around lending and we were early investors in Zopa, who was the first peer-to-peer -peer lender coming out of Europe, uh, investors in Wonga, we were investors in a company Prodigy Finance uh, in student lending who are doing exceptionally well. So that was the first area we saw great, great growth. Uh, second one was the neo banks and everything around new forms of doing digital banking. Um, we're investors in Revolut, who announced a $66 million raise uh, this week uh, and they started off doing uh, foreign exchange for people traveling abroad, but have now broadened into um, the place where people go for all of their day-to-day -day financial needs and become this real hub for your financial needs. Uh, so that's been really exciting growth from zero to 700,000 users over two years. Uh, it's extraordinary to see that kind of growth in financial services. And what about the cryptocurrency spectrum in general? I mean, we've had such volatility this week alone, whether you're looking at the Ethereum price, for example. How does this continue to grow or not, as the case may be? And our view as a VC is we're looking for how we're going to build real businesses. And I think Ethereum in particular is fascinating. There are so many different industries that could be transformed using Ethereum. The fact that you don't have, need to have a trusted intermediary, that you have the smart contracts that enable business, whether it's trade or it's uh, stores of value or it's diamond trade, whatever it might be, there's a, there's a lot you can do with, with smart contracts. Um, the question is how far away is that and how long does it take to get there and what mechanism do you use to get there? Does it justify having 100 different altcoins out there for every single use case? Or is there actually a lot that can be done with Ethereum itself? And that's what I'm trying to work out right now. Uh, I'm much less worried about the near-term volatility. Talking of volatility, we've seen plenty of volatility in some of the recent share offerings that we've seen in the US, for example, snap down once again today. Are you optimistic or slightly more nervous about where the exit routes go for companies such as yours? I think the IPO market is absolutely there if you've got a good company uh, and you have to be able to, to demonstrate that. Um, and then it's a question around where do you price the IPO? And I think Delivery Hero went out at a sort of fairly sensible level uh, and they're doing the, the classic way of doing it, which is beat and raise, beat and raise and, and build from there. Uh, and I think Snap was more disappointing, right, in its first set of results, uh, and maybe they went out a little bit too high. But still, a multi-billion dollar company created from nothing in five years is, is a pretty impressive result for Snap. Um, has your view on what a good company is changed, or indeed the life cycle of the good company? Because me, ha, is there now pressure on portfolio companies to not just have revenue, but also to be showing that they can be profitable as well? Do you need to be more obvious about a viable business model before you can start to exit? I think in Europe that's always been the case. You, I, don't think, I can't think of any tech IPO in Europe where the company hasn't been profitable or had a clear path to profitability, right? The unit economic stack up that it will get there. Um, and I think in the US that's not necessarily been the case. There have been a few that have managed to get out purely on growth, um, but we haven't seen that there, that here, so it's not here to lose. Um, I think the has, the, has the dynamics changed? Not really. I think growth, speed of growth is still what people really get excited by and a credible path to profitability. Are there any portfolio companies that look potentially ready to IPO? I think there's a couple of ours that are in that window and then it's, it's trying to get out at the, at the right price and with the right story. We uh, IPO'd uh, Talend last year and that's seen a sort of great share price performance since IPO. So that's a nice success story for us to think about for other portfolio companies. And M&A, of course, not the only route to exit is IPO, but there's also M&A. And 
are we seeing deep pockets coming from larger institutions wanting to get into the startup world? I think uh, the SoftBank 93 billion fund is, is a great indication, right? The fact that that's going to be based in London is, is going to be very interesting Does that worry to see. You, competition? Uh, no, because they're, they're way out of our range, right? They're, they want to invest minimum 500 million dollars, and we want to invest maximum 15 million dollars. So, no, I think it's an interesting exit route, right? You saw with them buying Arm that they are not short of ambition, right? They're willing to take out the biggest public tech company in the UK. So. That is a really interesting kind of strategic investment. So I think we'll see more of that, I think, coming from China in particular. Uh, the US continues to be engaged with Europe. You're seeing Google with DeepMind and with other acquisitions. Uh, Twitter bought one of our companies, Magic Pony, last year for a, a sort of big sort of strategic price. So we are seeing it, but not in huge volumes. And I think perhaps more of the volume might come from Asia over the coming years.